Well, I've got all sorts of things here with me today, and we'll use, we'll, you might use them all, might not. We'll see. Don't get too worried about that. We'll stay on time the way we normally do. Uh, I'm going to talk on something a little bit different today, a little different than even than what I had planned until just uh, within the last few days. I actually did a little switcheroo. Now, you've got several things we have to keep our eye on, okay? Uh, in fact, I didn't even get all the dots connected very well. First service, I forgot one. Uh, let me see if I can get them all this time. First of all, we're going to talk about the issue of the devil's shell game. What's the shell game? So we're going to talk about the shell game. Uh, we're going to talk about it in the context of some current events type situations. Okay? And of course, we'll be using the scripture. I encourage you to have your Bible ready to go to Matthew chapter 24. We'll be looking in Matthew chapter 24 quite a bit. We'll be looking at uh, some things in Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 13, and we'll look at some things in 2 Peter chapter 2, okay? That's the primary area where we're going to be going and looking at things as far as scriptural issues, and then some other current events things. We'll put it together. The devil's shell game. What's the story on the shell game? Have you ever seen the shell game played? The, sh the shell game is the, it's a carnival game where they have uh, three shells and one P, and they'll put the P in the three shells and spin them around to see which, you know, and, you, and you, if you can keep track of where they're moving it around, uh, you win the prize, okay? It's a carnival game. If you have a good carnival par barker, you will never get it right. It's a magic stunt. They can move that thing around and have it, and you'll never get it right. Somebody might win once in a while. It's usually a little kid or somebody working together with them that they'll give it to that'll make sure the money doesn't go out. But a good carnival barker can do that in such a way that you can be sitting there playing the game and you will think you're right on and you'll never have it. Even if you do hit it, they have a way to get the thing out of there and slip it in another one and you won't even know what happened. It's, it's a fake. It's a distraction game to get you distracted and to miss the point. Does the devil ever have the game going with us where things are moving and... Well, it's an attract. It's it's a uh, hard to keep up with where the thing, what's important and what isn't. You ever had that happen? We we'll talk about it in that context. We switched around some things that we're going to talk about today because, well, I told my son I'm going to. I was going to tell this one. I got his permission. He's not here today. He's off on a on a weekend uh, activity, but. Uh, and he's a teenager now, and he knows that when I sell, tell a cute story from his childhood, it's just about the cuteness. It's, I don't do anything to offend them. You know, I, I basically ter tell very few stories on them for that reason. But anyway, when we were in Minnesota, kids were both born in Minnesota, by the way. We were there about five years, and so they'd, both, of them, both of my children actually remember it very little, but they were both born there. Um, and Minnesota is in the Midwest. It's in the, in the plains. Um, and in the plains, you can see for miles. Sometimes you don't want to. My wife's grandmother came and visited us one time, and she said, I don't think from now on you can come visit me. I don't need to come and visit you anymore. I've seen more coin and corn and soybeans than I ever want to see again. Because you can see for miles, but in Minnesota, when you're seeing for miles, it's mostly corn and soybeans. You know, that's they just grow it in massive amounts. And so all corn and soybeans. But the other thing about the Midwest is, in the Midwest you can have tornadoes, especially in the spring. It's tornado area. There's an area referred to as Tornado Alley, where you can have tornadoes going through there pretty regularly. Uh, when the weather changes fast, the weather patterns, you can end up with tornadoes. Now, the people in the Midwest are kind of used to that, and they know how to keep track of it. And you can see for miles, so that they can usually kind of tell uh, what's happening and when to pay attention. And in the, the Midwest the northern Midwest, most all houses that are stick-built houses are going to have a, a, a basement. Now, there's a pretty simple reason why they have a basement, and it's not about the tornadoes. They have basements because you have to dig down eight feet to put the footings anyway, and so if you're going to dig that far down, they're going to make a basement. They're going to take everything out of there and, and have a basement. And so if you have a tornado, why, well, you just go down in the basement, and you're going to be fine. The house might, if your house would be one of the ones that gets leveled and taken away, if you're down under the, you know, under the floorboards, the foundation there, you're in a pretty safe situation, not a problem. Well, I'm sort of new about tornadoes. I, my childhood is in Michigan, and they have some of that, but Jenny's mostly from the southeast, and the southeast don't have that that much, don't deal with that that much. Well, anyway, 
I remember I had just gotten my cell phone. The first time I got a, a, a cell phone, and it was they were talking about tornado warnings, and the natives are used to. You just kind of keep your eye out and be, be attentive. I had to travel, so I was in my pickup, and I was traveling along. And again, you can see for miles. And I, I remember, huh, there's the tornado. There it is there. And I was talking to Jenny on the phone, and I said, oh, you know, you, you might want to be aware because I can see that tornado. And she says, what? You can see it? You're, you need to get off the road and get, on the, and, and get down in the ditch and be careful. I said, no, nah, it's over there. It's about 10 miles away. I can see it, and it's going right past me. It's going more your direction than it is my direction. I'm perfectly safe. And, well, she wasn't so sure on that, but she did hear, oh, okay, you need to be watching and be thinking about kind of, you know, let's get the family toward the, toward the basement. Okay. And so... She said, come on, kids, let's, you know, let's head toward the basement. Uh, there might be a tornado in the area, and let's do this. Let's get heading, and, you know, kids busy playing, and she had to try and get their attention, and Robbie was just a little guy, just really a little guy, barely walking, barely talking, and he got that eye of that business. He finally caught on. We need to go to the basement, and he started, oh, oh, we, we got to hurry. We got to get to the basement. The tomato is coming. The tomato is coming. The tomato is coming. He had no idea what was coming. He just knew something was coming, and he was all excited that we needed to take care of it. And he's running around all over the place. The tomato is coming. The tomato is coming. I think of that in terms of today's events, of the things this summer that have been going on and I've been hearing so much about in current events. And especially this week, the Pope is coming. The Pope is coming. And I think sometimes I'm hearing it in the context of kind of like Robbie yelling, a tomato is coming, the tomato is coming. All sorts of commotion and people saying all sorts of things and all sorts of firing up things and things that are happening. And can we look at current events a little bit? And can we try and look at current events in the context of what does the Bible say about current events? And can we see if we can have a discussion without getting too fired up or being too just avoid it and forget it altogether. Can we see if we can find that ground of where is that? Matthew chapter 24, Matthew's Gospels. Matthew's Gospel chapter 24. Jesus is talking. Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is Jesus' sermon about last day events. It's his sermon about just before the coming of Jesus. But actually, it isn't even the intent to... It, it doesn't start out that way. Matthew 24, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the building of the temple. Notice the situation. The disciples say, look at this grandiose temple that God has helped us build. And God has put this together for his people. And Jesus just kind of says, eh, not one stone's going to be left turned on top of another. He, he just kind of deflected their comment is really what happened. And it stunned them so bad because their preconceived ideas were such that this is God's temple, and it certainly can't be destroyed until the second coming of Jesus, until the coming of the Lord. And when the coming of the Lord, which they thought meant to set up the kingdom of Israel, etc., and, and, but, but again, they, they've got all these preconceived opinions, and Jesus just kind of goes, eh, not one stone left turning on top of another. And that leads them to ask several questions. They thought they were asking one question. How could this be? When will this be? And when will the coming of the Lord be? They were sure they were asking one question three times. They weren't. Have you ever noticed that when you get looking forward, get looking off, you can do this real easily here in Arizona where there's mountains around all over the place. From my house, it gets a little tricky. Here in the desert, you can see for miles. Thankfully, we don't see too many soybeans. But you can see for miles, and you get to see these mountain tips and tops. And have you ever noticed they all look like they're right next to each other? You know, oh, there's a mountain there. If the sky is clear enough, you can see possibly. It's, it's fun to be on the road heading north, and you can see the tips of the mountains up in Flagstaff, you know, up and beyond. But those different mountains are not all one chain. Just because you see them, sometimes there's valleys in between that you can't. Hard to get your depth straight in that. Does that make sense? And the disciples here didn't have their depth straight. They were sure they were asking one question. You know, the destruction of the temple happened in AD 70, and we're still waiting for the second coming of Jesus. There's a valley in between those, those mountains. Is that a fair way to say it? 
Okay? But Jesus says, well, let me tell you some things to watch out for along the way. And he says that in the context of AD 70. He said to them, now, be careful and be cautious because there's some things that are going to happen. And when you see these things happen, know and be ready and take action accordingly. Isn't that what he said? Now, in that with what he said was, oh, by the way, how many Christians died in Jerusalem in AD 70 when the city fell? How many Christians died? Do you know the answer? Zero. Not one. Why? Because they were aware and were watching from this, okay? Something else a little bit silly, though. Seems in the silly category. Because Jesus had said there's some things to be watching out for and be ready and take action accordingly. Do you know, this is out of... I'm, I'm going to be a little Adventist-y today. I'm going to deal with some things from some Adventist perspective. Do some Adventist reading even to you a little bit. But in the little book, The Great Controversy, there's something that is quoted from Melman's history. A guy named Melman wrote a historical book, and here's what he says. Here's what it says. At the predictions given by Christ concerning the destruction of Jerusalem were fulfilled to the letter. The Jews predict, uh, experience the truth of his words of warning. With much measure you me meet, it shall be measured to you again. Signs and wonders appeared, foreboding disaster and doom. In the midst of the night, an unnatural light shone over the temple and the altar. Upon the clouds on sunset were pictured chariots of men of war gathering for battle. The priests ministered by night in the sanctuary were terrified by the mysterious sounds. The earth uh, trembled, and a multitude of voices were heard crying, Let us depart hence. The great eastern gate, which was so heavy that it could hardly be shut by a score of men, which was secured by immense bars of iron fastened deep into the pavement of solid stone, opened one night without anybody knowing how it happened. For seven years, a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. By day and by night, he chanted in a wild dirge, the voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, a voice against the whole people. This is from Melman's history of the Jewish peoples. In other words, you get the picture? There is this nut, this wacko, that's just wandering around saying, oh, Jerusalem is doomed, Jerusalem is doomed, Jerusalem is doomed. It goes on to say they tried to shut him up, and the more they tried to shut him up, the more he yelled. It goes on to say that they even arrested him, and he, he wouldn't complain about being arrested. They even tried to persecute him. They tortured him. They did whatever. He never complained. He'd just keep screaming, this is what's going to happen to Jerusalem. They couldn't shut him up. When Jerusalem fell, when the soldiers came in in A.D. 70, he was one of the people killed. In other words, all he was was a carnival barker, yapping and yelling, accomplishing nothing except making a lot of racket, and it helped nobody. You get what I mean? Just a lot of noise. Now, the Christians knew, and the Christians were witnessing, and the Christians left when they saw the signals. They saw the signals that, that Jesus had mentioned, and they paid attention, and they acted accordingly. This other guy was just making a bunch of noise and wasn't paying attention to anything. See the difference? Huh. That was Jerusalem. Did it happen the way Jesus said it would happen? It happened exactly the way Jesus said it was going to happen. Then he goes on and he talks about things that are going to happen in the last days. And he talks about things that are leading right up through to the last days. Things that will happen just before the coming of Jesus. Okay? Be worth paying attention. All right? Now, let me wander you over to Revelation. Revelation Chapter 12 and 13. Revelation chapter 12, there was a great sign in heaven. 
And it tells the story, I believe, prophetically about the birth of Jesus, the experiences around the birth of Jesus, about Jesus going back off into heaven, about the devil being angry, about war in heaven, and this dragon that is warring against Christ and his peoples, and the problems that were going on there. Chapter 13 starts with this dragon going off and watching at the the sea, and he's just watching there, watching, 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 and it says, and I saw this beast come up out of the seas, waiting for his partners in crime, the, the, the dragon is, waiting for his partners in crime. And it talks about a sea beast in chapter 13, coming up out of the sea. A funny thing about that sea beast. Among other things, this sea beast has, the, has a life and death experience. It has a death experience. It has a resurrection experience. It has a come and worship me experience. And then afterwards, we have another beast coming up out of the land, and this other beast does something odd. It encourages the people to worship this sea beast that has a death experience and a resurrection experience and asks to be worshipped. Okay? A couple of things here. I believe that the Scripture tells us that God is a family name. We've talked about this many times. That the Scripture says that the name God is a family name. That there is God the Father, that there is God the Son, that there is God the Holy Spirit. If you want a, man, a made-up man name that doesn't show up anywhere in Scripture, but it is the word Trinity. I'm not going to argue that word one way or the other. Do I believe God is a family name? Yes, I do. Do I believe that there is God the Father... God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, who had a death experience and a resurrection experience. Do I believe there is the Holy Spirit who, can I use the expression, God the Holy Spirit, who points us to Jesus, the God who was, had a death experience and a resurrection experience. Can, can we agree on that? And I'm going to believe that, there was, that the devil has a counterfeit family that he call a counterfeit God family with the dragon, with this sea beast that has a life and death experience and is calling people to worship it, and a land beast that encourages people to worship the sea beast, a counterfeit family of God. I believe that. I believe prophecy says that. I believe it says you get back toward the end of time, just before the coming of Jesus, you're going to have this counterfeit group with the devil being the one that is the head. Remember Isaiah chapter 14. It is the devil him saying, self saying, I will be the most high. I will be like the most high. Remember, I will be like God. And then you have this sea beast saying, I am the, I will be the false Christ. And the land beast, I will be the false Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, in the middle of all this, as this is going on, just before the coming of Jesus, this is going to get very active. Now, who in the world are these things? Well, the Bible's pretty clear in saying the one that is this dragon is pretty clearly who? It tells us, right? Verse 9, it says, that's the devil and Satan. Don't miss who that is. All right? Now, where do these other two get into the picture? Well, let's try something else in there. Seventh-day Adventists believe. Follow me now. Seventh-day Adventists believe that God has always had a people that are keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus with the idea in mind of being like it's the Bible said to Abraham based back in, in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 12 where the Bible says that God said to Abraham, I want you to be a blessing. I want you to live the way, the principles that God gave you to live And I want you to do it in such a way, I promise I will bless you, and I want you to be a blessing to the rest of the world. I want you to show the world what living the principles of God and trusting God as as your great but benevolent creator and, and friend and parent, and use any of those metaphors, do that and I will bless you, and in blessing you, I will bless the world. I believe that. 
I believe God has always had a people that he has, that is his, are his people to be what Abraham was to be in his day, and that is to represent what God is like and be a blessing to the community. Okay? I still believe that. Seventh-day Adventists believe that the reason God Joe pulled a people out to be a movement is to represent, to bring things back to the belief system, the following the God of the Bible. That, that that has gotten lost through the centuries and that God has, the reason Seventh-day Adventists exist is not to be another denomination, not to be another something else, but to say this movement, this belief system is the, this belief is what God is like and follow this and God will bless and follow this and be a blessing to the people whoever you come in contact with that's what Adventists believe we also believe a couple of other things when don't you follow down through history follow down through history and it is interesting that there has that there has always been well I tell people as a minister of the gospel it's a joy to be able to tell people about Jesus. It's a joy to be able to tell people that there is a God that loves you. It's a joy to be able to tell people that there, that there is a God who loves you as a special person and has great plans for your life and, 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 you know, and loves you in every way possible. I have never once had to explain to somebody that there's a devil. Start talking about the devil... And people say, oh, yeah, I know about him. He's around in my house pretty regularly. We have regular, inf you know, we deal with that regularly. We deal with trouble and difficulties and discouragements and down. It seems like we're being picked on and harassed on a regular. Never had to tell somebody the explanation, the idea that there is such a thing as a, as a devil that is out to cause trouble for you. People say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know about that. I feel that. The devil has claimed from, Revelation, uh, from Genesis chapter 3, that God is not just, that God is not fair, that God is a liar, that God is holding you down, that God is being mean to you, and the devil is saying, I can run a government, I can run a, a world, I can run a planet better than he can. And the devil has claimed from, the, from sin entering the world that he is the one that's in charge of this world and this planet. And with that in mind, anybody that tries to be tr stay true to the God of heaven, the devil is going to try and cause problems. We know of that from the book of, of Job. The book of Job, where God was had a man named Job that was following God, and the devil said, he's not following God for any reason except he's your spoiled brat. And God said... Make an example out of him and see what happens. And the Bible says over and over again, the devil did everything he could because he was angry at somebody that would say, I want to follow the God of heaven. In other words, in a sinful world, somebody that says, I make it a point to follow the God of heaven, to be true to his principles, is going to have trouble and difficulties. Abraham did. Noah did. And the ultimate example is, Jesus had plenty of difficulties in trying to follow the principles of God. And the devil saying, oh yeah, let's see if you're serious, right? The disciples in Bible times that tried to follow, that were trying to be about following the principles of God, was it always hunky-dory and easy? Notice, if you will, that the scripture even says you follow what, what Peter says, you follow what Paul says, you follow what John says in the writings of the New Testament, and they say, ah, you're having trouble with difficulties and having trouble with persecutions and having trouble with harassments because the devil and his cohorts are constantly making it a challenge to follow the Lord and his principles. There will be difficulties. And again, I don't have many people that say, oh, I didn't know that. Most people say, oh, yeah, I know about that. I run into some of those difficulties and challenges. All right. Down through history, there is a historical situation. There is a historical movement of a man claiming to be God. There is a historical background of a man claiming to be able to forgive sins in the name of him, and to be God on earth, calling himself literally the vicar of Christ on earth. Hmm. We have in historical documents where that got really, really ugly when there were people trying to break away and say, I want to follow, follow the God of heaven. There is history in the New Testament from the time of Jesus onward. History is littered 
with destruction, persecution, and awful things happening in the name of religion toward people that have tried to follow God and, his, and, and follow their conscience. It happens on a regular basis. The history is there. The history is there of a horrid background of this kind of thing happening. Anybody who is a Protestant will say that historical background of the papacy pushing people and saying, you will worship my way or I will kill you, that's just a historical fact. Roman Catholic Christians will look at the history in the Middle Ages and say, oh yeah, our history, that doesn't look real good. That doesn't stand real good. That wasn't too good. That was, that was not very fair. That was not very nice. Roman Catholic Christians will agree with that. That's simply a matter of fact of history. Protestant Christians from the 1500s onward have been saying, watch out when things go in the direction of mixing religion and government together, and watch out especially because you're usually going to have religion trying to claim to be the leader of this whole thing. Watch out for anything that has to do with universal governments coming under religion. Watch out when religion is saying, let's all come together under one government and let's be following. Watch out. And history is littered with disasters of that happening. Which makes it in real interesting that this last summer, again, this last summer, the encyclical that came out from the Pope, well, let's all be part of, let's, let's take care of the land better. And in the name of taking care of the land and the ecology, let's come together and let's take a day off. Guess which day it'll be. And let's do that in the name of taking care of the world. Now, watch something, folks. Do we believe as Christians we ought to be taking care of the land? Of course we do. Have we done a very good job of it? No, we haven't. Should we do better? Yeah, we should. Should we take care of our environment? Yeah. Did the Bible say to humans in the freight back in the Garden of Eden to begin with, have dominion over the world and take care of it and do it with responsibility? Did God say that? Should people, Christian people, behind be behind that idea? Well, I would say yes. Now, should we do that in the context of doing it from a political, let's force each other and here's how we're going to do it? That usually is where it gets into trouble. But anyway... Most of us could, disagree, could agree with the cyclical of, we ought to take care of the land. We can agree with that. But when you get into, oh, we've got a great idea. Let's force everybody on how to worship so that the worship part is taking care of the land. Now that's where we get into a little bit of trouble. And it really gets interesting when you have the president jumping on board and saying, I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis's encyclical and deeply admire the Pope's decisions to make the case clearly, powerfully, and with the full moral authority of his position for action on global climate change. Hmm, this starts getting a little interesting. I believe the United States must be a leader in this effort. Oh. Secretary General of the United Nations. The Secretary General welcomes the papal encyclical released by His Holy Father and therefore urges governments to place global common good above their national interests. Getting interesting. By the way, here's where I'd say Adventists, be careful. Can I say that? Be careful. Do I believe there is going to be a unity of church and state just before the coming of Jesus? Yes, I do. Do I believe there is a false trinity trying to put itself up as the trinity of God? Yes, I do. Do I believe there are signs that we should be watching for as far as the soonness of the second coming of Jesus? Yes, I do. Oh, you want another wild one? This is straight out of Seventh-day Adventist. Can I be Adventist-y? 
ninth volume of the Testimonies, written written about 1910, okay, so over 100 years ago. We are living in the time of the end. The fast-fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near as hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already following on the, uh, 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 falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. Does that mean it's the seven last plagues? No. I remember as a young minister in the 1980s, I had somebody tell, come grab me. Pastor, do you believe... AIDS is one of, the seven, one of the seven last plagues. Well, 30 years later, that's laughable. At the time, I said, no. Are we living in a time when things are getting worse and worse and worse? Yes. Are signs fulfilling that the second coming of Jesus is getting near? Yes. Does that mean this one's it and the National Sunday Law is soon to be happening this year or within the next year, year, year or two? Maybe and maybe not. Let's be careful of not go telling God how he's going to end this thing and bring it together. Do we believe that there, oh, this thing in 1910. It goes on, you read, you read through it, ninth volume of testimony, first chapter. It goes on and talking about, I saw, I saw Great giant buildings built in our cities being monuments to our wealth and to our grandeur. And I saw them, uh, the, uh, men saying, they can ne we, we have got it figured out how to build them and they can never burn. And I saw that when something happens, the firemen won't be able to put it out. And boy, did I read that in, 2000, in 2011 when those things came. Now, is the Pope right that wealthy nations have taken advantage of the poor nations and that greed has happened to make people extremely wealthy at the expense of the poor? I would say yes. I would say the Twin Towers were a monument to our great wealth and, and, and ingenuity and some people weren't too happy about that. But, may I remind you too, the falling of the Twin Towers was 14 years ago. My kids have no memory of it. It was before their time. Is it eminent as in immediate? No. Is it a sign? I would say yes. 1980s, the late 1980s, I think it was about 1990 a book came out called The Keys of This Blood. It was a book all about how we were going to get to a one-world nation. We were going to get to a one-world nation. And President George H.W. Bush and Pope John Paul and um, Mr. Gorbachev were uniting to put together a one-world nation. And the Adventists jumped all over this thing and were talking about like everything. Did anything come of it? Actually, yes. I would suggest it had a lot to do with setting up where we are now and the strength. By the way, you know, don't you do any reading? The papacy had a lot to do with this, the United States and Cuba coming back together. He was the negotiator between those two. Okay? Just like John Paul was the negotiator to bring down the, 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 the Berlin Wall in, in 88. Is there a lot of maneuvering behind the scenes? Does the papacy have a lot of power in this? Is there a discussion for one world order? Yes. Be aware, but don't be panicked, and don't overplay your hand. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people tell me in five years the Lord's going to be here. It isn't going to go beyond five years. And my favorite one is a tragedy. A lady that really got after me because I wouldn't say that I thought the Lord was going to come in five years. That was 25 years ago. She is not active in Christianity today. Let's be careful. 
Let's not just be out there running around, the tomato is coming, the tomato is coming, the tomato is coming. Let's not be out there running around just screaming, Jerusalem is falling, Jerusalem is falling, Jerusalem is falling. We don't need to be chicken little. But do we believe the second coming of Jesus is near? Oh, yes, we do. Do we believe Bible prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes? Yes, we do. Is there more Bible prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled? I would say yes, but I would suggest we're missing the point and playing the devil's share, share, shell games if that's where our focus is because the issue is, well, can I take you to the issue? Would you turn with me to Second Peter chapter 2? Second Peter chapter 2. It's chapter 3, I want. Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In other words, the day of the Lord will come when people are caught off guard. In which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, but the earth and the works thereof uh, that are in it will be burned up. Therefore... Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? Don't be out there bellering. The tornado, the tomato is coming, the tomato is coming, the tomato is coming. The issue is how to live. Verse 11, therefore, since we know these things, what manner of persons? Verse 12, looking for and hastening the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire. and they'll, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, verse 14, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blemish. Look, folks, I come from a very unique perspective, and I'm scared to death to even be talking this subject because... I have heard, I have grown up in the Seventh-day Adventist message. I've grown up around big crowds in Seventh-day Adventist church. I've been in great crowds where there have been much discussion about the Illuminati or about this group or about that group and about the dollar bill has an eye in it and this is all parts of the signs of the end and oh, I've heard some incredible signs of the end stories. Enough that'll have you go, hoy. Do I believe Jesus is coming soon? Yes, I do. Do I believe the Bible prophesied a false trinity that is going to be active and that is going to be pushing anybody that has fought for following the, the, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus? Yes, I do. Do we have it all figured out of exactly how it's going to happen and what's going to happen? I would say, no, we don't. And we ought to be careful about predicting things that we don't have a clue on. And let's not be carnival barkers out there ranting and raving or yelling, the tomato is coming, the tomato is coming. But let's be following the Lord Jesus Christ. If the focus is on anybody, if the focus is on the Pope and not on Christ, we are playing the devil's shell game. If the, popus, if, if the focus is on what Mr. Obama is doing and not on what Christ is doing, we are out of focus. Be aware? Yes. Try to pin this thing down? Let's be careful. We have an influence with our community that requires that we get it right, and that we be sane, and that we talk about Christ and Him crucified and Him coming back again. That's the focus. I've seen the focus beyond all sorts of different things. I've seen the focus on the dollar bill in the name of the church. I've seen the focus on, oh my, 
the focus needs to be on Christ. Do I believe Jesus is coming soon? Yes, I do. What does soon mean? I don't know. Is he going to come in the next year or two? He certainly could. But I don't want to get in the position of saying, oh, yes, he is. When will Jesus come? I don't know. I will say the focus should be on representing Jesus so that more people are ready for him when he comes. Isn't that the issue? Anything else, and we're playing the devil's shell game. Heavenly Father, we long for Jesus. We long to see him. But have our focus, please, Lord, be on Jesus and his coming and not be on the, come, the signs or the time of trouble or any other terms. May our focus be on Jesus is our prayer in his name. Amen.